Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to talk to you today about Eli Review. I'm Melissa Graham Meeks, and I'm the Director of Professional Development, and it's my pleasure to support instructors in all the things. And today, we're going to really focus on one part of the Eli Review process. And we have some people who are joining today's sessions who aren't familiar with Eli. So I'm just going to give a quick, quick overview. Basically, Eli is a peer review tool that's designed to help students give each other effective feedback, but also to help them practice critical thinking. The app structures the writing process so that students share a little piece of writing, and then they give feedback according to the questions that you design. Because of those questions, you get some information that allows you to debrief or to talk to your students about what happened in peer review and to celebrate student success or to point out where most students are struggling. Then the idea is that students can use their peer feedback to reflect on the feedback they've received in order to plan their revisions. The idea is that you'll do this as often as will fit in your term, however long your term is, seven and a half weeks, 10 weeks, 16 weeks, whatever you got. Repeat the process as often as possible. The showcase is focused on giving feedback because our team really talks about the concept of giver's gain. That is, by looking closely at other writers' work, in holding that work against the criteria, you learn something that you couldn't learn as the writer of the same task. And so instructors set the stage for what students notice and what they talk about in the review tasks. So we've invited two excellent psychology professors to share their most effective peer reviews today. And we're gonna start with Aviva from San Francisco State, and I'm gonna invite her to share her screen and tell us a little bit about the course you teach and the writing task and review task you're gonna walk us through. Well, thank you, Melissa, for having me here today um, to give this presentation with Vanessa, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, I teach um, upper division writing intensive courses in the major, so I do that in anthropology, and I also do that in psychology. So I'm getting um, third and fourth year students. I prefer to get them in third year because then you can really make a difference for them as they move into their into their senior year um, capstone stuff. And I'm helping them um, not just learn the moves of writing that they're building on their their first year writing classes, but I'm also helping them exit the major with some confidence writing within their own discipline, um, within their own profession. So um, I wanted to show you this um, task today, which is a research proposal draft task that happens. It's actually my second of 10 assignments in the 16 week semester. And um, I wanted to show you this task for a couple reasons. Um, one is that um, I do it early on in the semester. So I'm really having them do some preliminary research and then have them do some thinking. And it really sets the stage for a lot of later thinking and later writing. But I also wanted to show this task because I actually do it in class and I do it as a one-to-one, uh, -one, um, non-anonymous, so it's a bit different from how other people tend to use Eli more outside of class or in groups. And um, I also do something funky with this task, which is I structure, this is a tip I learned from Melissa, I structure the order I want them to do their review tasks in. So you can see that in these instructions here. And um, I'm also, this is early on in the semester, so I'm training them on how to do peer review also. So the instructions give them a lot more um, kind of ideas about what you should be doing in review in different stages. So, um, I think I answered those questions. Um, and I guess if you wanna see the assignment guidelines, it's very, very broad because even as I'm training them to be psychology writers, I want them to be transferable to other skills. Um, and I always try to kind of hold this in balance of like, I'm training you to be writers in psychology, but I'm also just training you to be good writers. And maybe not all of you are going to grad school and not all of you are gonna write psychology papers after you exit the major. So what kind of basic writing skills do you need if you find yourself in a teaching program or you find yourself in the health sciences. Um, and so I structure this to require certain kinds of components of them and then the review follows the prompt of the assignment. 
So you can see here that I ask for topics and subtopics. I'm checking in on APA style, which some of my students come to the course already prepared to do, and some of them are like very lost. So actually another funky thing I do in this review is I kind of ask them how much they know about APA style, which is a way to get feedback actually from the reviewers. Um, so I'll show you that little move that I do. Um, I ask them to think about going to the literature and this activity actually prepares them to do a literature search. It's between collecting some preliminary data and then moving to the literature to see what the literature can do. But it's also helping them develop questions to move from primary source material to secondary source material um, and kind of try to simulate that and where a proposal might fit in that thinking, right? Not fully developed thinking yet, but still informed by something. And actually, uh, the first assignment that this follows um, has already asked them to do some of that basic structuring around what they're going to focus on. So there's a little bit about aspired interview and survey data, a little bit about research terms they might be thinking about as they plan to do the literature search and a little bit about research question thinking. So that's the assignment. Am I good on time, Melissa, or did I miss anything? You're doing great. Okay, um, so, so you can see here that I've got these steps that I've outlined for them, and I guess now I barely ever use this view, but this is the view that we're, we're gonna use as it zoomed in enough too, I can do that a little bit. Sometimes. Yeah, that looks clear, thank you. Sometimes my students say, I can't see what your screen is looking at. So um, I, I mentioned that I outline the different steps and I asked them actually to like go in order here. Um, and so I actually start them here with a trait identification set um, where I'm asking them basically like following the assignment guidelines, did your reviewer put any of these, these things in? You know, hopefully all of them, but you know, we always know that it helps them to find actually, I have no idea what those topics and subtopics are, or literature wasn't really thought about so much here, or the research terms, that's a key one that a lot of my students miss, or they don't know how to come up with research terms. So this is a place where we can intervene and have conversations with each other about what does it mean to come up with terms that are actually gonna find new productive literature based on the topic you've chosen. And it fits really well with stuff we do in the following weeks on how to do research in the literature. Um, thinking about the interviewer survey data, sometimes my students do observations, but not with COVID, of course. And then thinking about a research question. And this is um, kind of the, the second of multiple moments in which we talk about research questions um, and what that means. And I know Vanessa is going to talk about hypotheses a lot in her presentation. And I, I really use the, the language of research question, argument, hypothesis, um, thesis statement to try to unpack and demystify those as actually all relating to each other, of course. but doing kind of different things for us analytically as writers. So in this stage of the project, we're still talking about research questions um, since we're in like the second or third week of the semester. So they identify that first, then they move um, to think about each of those things in turn. So I say, okay, so the topic and the subtopic terms um, and the future research terms, so this is A and C, and this is very term focused, which is why I put A and C together, you know, are, are good in the jargon. You know, I get what they mean, but I'm not quite sure if they're gonna actually find me productive things in the literature. And they're too generalized. You know, the student that just puts learning as their search term, you know, they're gonna get thousands and thousands and thousands of results. Um, and then we do that for step three, we do that for the literature. And in this one, this is one of those funky things I do where it says, you know, I'm not sure if it's an APA style. And this actually gives me feedback as the instructor about like how many of my students feel pretty confident about this, erroneously or not, and how many of my students are like, I have no idea, you haven't taught me that yet, so I couldn't possibly help my peer out with this. Um, and I think that's just kind of a fun thing that we can do sometimes that also gives us feedback as instructors, takes the pulse of the class, so to speak. Um, and then, let's see, where did I go? Step four is actually a scaled response and it relates to the connection between the aspired interview and survey data and the research questions. And, you know, why am I doing this as a scaled response versus some other kind of ELI criteria? It's early in the semester. I'm trying to teach them how to use ELI and all its diverse tools. So I actually designed this review to like force them to figure out all the different tools of ELI as well. So here, you know, I have a five point scale and, you know, I'm trying to get them to think about do the research questions and the proposed data kind of go together or not. Um, so 
you can see here I have strong, they're there, but they can be better explained. They're implied, and we use this to talk a little bit about um, assumptions, and then we use this to talk a little bit about developments and being overly concise, and I start um, introducing concision and development to them at this point in the semester two. And then we go up to step five, which is um, really sets me up for the lecture that follows this activity on what is a research question and what's a good research question and what do you know we do a lot of brainstorming but this gives them some criteria to think about in terms of um, what kind of research question we hope to have and these you can see these are all positive trait criteria for how I'm teaching them how to write research questions um, and then um, I have them finish with doing um, contextual comments. And this is where, again, I'm trying to teach the describe, evaluate, suggest, trying to teach them how to do contextual comments because this might be the first time they're doing them in Eli. And I kind of let them choose whatever they think the writer needs to work on the most in terms of that. And then the final comments um, uh, respond to head notes. I forgot to mention that. Um, I also have them do head notes in this, which is um, just a little bit more framing for the reviewer about what's needed. I think I'm at 10 minutes, eh, Melissa? Yeah, you are. So in one sentence, how do you know this um, very detailed review is working? I made a list, so I guess I would just have to practice my one sentence. Um, so I do in-class debriefs, so um, I can actually see that they're actually internalizing I'm not gonna fit this in one sentence. Okay, there's four reasons. Um, I see internalization um, through in-class um, debriefs. I see transferability in terms of how they take um, this jargon practice and research question quality practice um, and use of identification with criteria across the course. So internalization, transferability. I see timeliness, because this is actually like a 30 minute review we do in class. So can we get through this review in a reasonable amount of time? Help me pace them in terms of what I can expect of them on Eli and I see success in terms of their final product so my one sentence is internalization transferability success and timeliness outstanding thank you so much for sharing and we'll have um, a little bit of time for questions after Vanessa presents so Vanessa your your turn to tell us about psychology proposals Oh, thank you. So welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here, Joan and CJ and John. And it's so nice to get to present with Aviva and to be with Melissa. Um, so I am an assistant teaching professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So I'm, I have a really rough life of li living in Santa Barbara. Um, and at Santa Barbara, we're a research institution. And so as a teaching professor, I sort of have the opposite. So most research professors do mostly research and a little teaching. I have the opposite where I do a lot of teaching and a little research. So that's kind of my, my role. And I'm in the psychological and brain sciences department. Uh, so I will share, I made slides because I'm an overachiever. Um, and so I just wanted to go quickly through one of the um, assignments, kind of how I came up and really how I should say how Melissa and I came up with the assignment and review because Melissa is incredibly supportive in all that she does. Um, so when you think about what students need, right, so I kind of tried to back it up a little, like why would I use Eli Review in the first place? Um, and when you think about it, what students really need is they need opportunities to construct knowledge and they need opportunities to gain access to to really understand what does it mean to be active members of the discipline? How do I, how do I navigate in this disciplinary world, right? And so these structured peer reviews activities, um, one of the arguments we have at UCSB with people that Melissa knows, Maggie and Linda, we talk about creating disciplinary access by providing students with the opportunity to practice their, these, these writing conventions in this case and these, um, these sort of deepening understanding of concepts um, in really heavily scaffolded ways. And that's what Eli Review really provides is this wonderful way to scaffold students' knowledge construction and disciplinary access. Um, so when we think about being transparent with disciplinary access, the things we, we kind of focus on, um, so if you're thinking about what would I even do an Eli assignment on, you would think about what kind of questions get asked in our discipline, how do we answer questions in psychology, what are the writing conventions in psychology, and what are considered appropriate types of evidence in psychology. So those are kinds of the things that led me to pick the kind of way I did the uh, set up the assignment and then the review. And so this is a little bit messy, so just look over here at the figure first. 
So just to give you a context of how I use Eli Review in this course, it's an upper division research methods course, um, and they write, a, they write up an APA style paper. So introduction, methods, results, and conclusion. Um, and so they have a, a, what I chose to focus on, um, what I noticed is that students really struggle with creating a rationale for their experiments, and they struggle with writing clear hypotheses. So that was kind of what I decided um, the, what they're having trouble with is really setting up their arguments, you know, with literature and previous research and theory of why they should get what they think they're going to get in their experiment, right, of specific hypothesis. So the Eli assignment was basically set up to scaffold them through that process. Um, there is some context. So they do do a lab assignment before they do this Eli assignment to really kind of delve into what does a rationale look like. They look at a sample one, they find one in an article, you know, so they have some context for what the word rationale means. And then they in week six, and we have a 10 week quarter at UCSB. So in week six uh, is when they do the Eli review writing. And then in week seven is when they do the peer review. And as Melissa said, the peer review is, is the really um, kind of important part from a learning perspective for the students. Um, the other thing that I do have them do as part of this class, just to just to show the kind of full full disclosure of what I do with Eli, um, once you see the results, um, they also do a Eli review task on writing up a two by two ANOVA because they and this focuses much more heavily on writing conventions with APA style, but they struggle a lot with writing up you know kind of results sections in ways that are that are appropriate um, that, that psychologists think are appropriate. Um, and so they do have an ANOVA writing assignment and then a peer review for that. And then they do their final paper is due um, during finals week, which for us is week 11. So the idea is they use all the feedback they get from Eli to, to sort of um, inform their, their final paper. And so you can kind of see how what I put, what types of questions we ask and what's considered appropriate evidence is some of these. And then how do we answer the questions in our disciplinary context in writing conventions, I think are sort of the other thing that we're hitting um, with my particular reviews um, and how they're set up. So I put in like these instructor notes. So like, what would I tell someone who is thinking about Eli? Um, I would say the essential features of the writing assignment that Melissa has taught me um, is to clearly state the context and the purpose of the writing. Um, Cause I was really bad at that when we started and with Melissa's help, I'm getting better. You also want to make Linda Edlercaster. <laughs> yes. And Linda. Yes. And Maggie. I mean, I've been, I've been influenced by all these amazing people. Um, you also need to have specific guidelines on what to write. And then I tend to include a sample writing assignment. And I think that the students, there's a lot of feedback from the students that that's really helpful. So the rationale assignment looks like this. It has a purpose and overview section. And so this is why are you doing this and what's the context of it? Um, so here it says, you know, the rationale and hypotheses are essentially your outline for your introduction, writing a clear rationale that enables readers to connect theory and observations to your hypothesis is critical for doing this well. So it's focusing on that particular piece. And then they have steps of what they're doing. Um, and so I give them specific guidelines and then I also write and a sample. So I, I basically, you know, write one for them so they can see what that looks like. Um, and so this is my sample. Um, the sample that I write to help contextualize it is the same example they do in that lab five exercise. So it's something they've seen before. So it's sort of like, here's the exercise you do in lab. Here's what this would look like if you actually um, wrote it up. Yes, Linda adler Kastner, she is famous and amazing. I know. I totally am blessed to be working on this with Linda. I agree. I will tell her you're a fan because she's amazing. Um, the other thing I would say essential features of a review. Um, this is the hard part too. You have to actually know what you want your students to do. And one of the things that I think happens to instructors a lot is we have an idea in our head about what we want them to do, but we have not really articulated it very clearly anywhere, including possibly to ourselves. So that's kind of the first step is to really figure out what you actually want the students to do with the assignment. Um, I like to use the trait identification as Aviva showed you as well. So you might, you want to make sure you have clearly stated traits to identify. Um, Melissa has helped. She says use, describe, evaluate, revise. So I do that. And 
I would also say give them specific guidelines and even sentence stems to help students give feedback. Because if you make it real general, they tend to give really general feedback. So if you say, was this good? They said, yeah, it was great. And that's not really helpful feedback for sort of getting something out of it. So um, very the, the specificity, I think, is what makes the review good or not. Um, and that's the hard part. So for this rationale assignment, um, again, as I said, they start with trait identification. So they basically have to check a box, were there statements of theory in this outline? Were there observations from research? Were there explicit connections between theory and research that justify their hypotheses? And then did they correctly state their hypotheses? And um, one of the very cool things that Eli Review will do is it'll show you, uh, as Avivo was mentioning, what your students are doing. And so you can also use this as great teaching feedback. So I can have, look at my review data and see that the connections between theory and research, only 60% of students were checking that other students were doing this. And so I knew this is what we're gonna focus on in the next lecture, whereas observations from research, there was no problem with that. So it also does kind of help inform your um, teaching. And then again, I use the describe, evaluate, revise model. So for describe, um, I give them a sentence stem for each of these. So focusing in this assignment on connections. So the connections the writer makes are, they fill something out because, um, and then evaluate, I evaluate the two parts separately. So the rationale and then the hypotheses, because some of them write a clear rationale and don't write their hypotheses well and vice versa and, you know, all those kind of things. So you do want to think about when you're writing the review of, isolating the specific constructs you're interested in as much as possible as well. Um, and then suggested revisions um, statements can be helpful. So Melissa asks, well, how do you know it's working? Um, so I do end of quarter feedback. And so the majority of students felt that Eli Review helped their understanding. So I basically said, did the Eli Review assignment of rationale help your understanding of how to write a rationale? So 81% agreed. And for the ANOVA, 190% agreed. Um, so the majority, not everyone, of course. Um, just to give you an idea of what students said, like what are some of the things they said, and so here's the quote. So it's preliminary assignments for the paper really helped in decreasing the level of stress that accompanies my course. I might be famous for having a hard course. Um, also, doing the rationale assignment before the intro methods rough draft help a lot in understanding the structure of the introduction section of our paper. So I thought that was interesting because they kind of said exactly what I was hoping would happen. So it was nice to get a little bit of direct feedback um, from students. Just a tiny bit of data. ECSB apparently, as Mike showed in the biology one, we're kind of obsessed with data. Um, we've been trained really well to show administration data. So um, this is a regression analysis, and you don't have to worry if you don't know what that is. But basically what it lets you do is predict things while taking into account lots of variables. And so basically what I predicted is their paper, their final paper score. Um, and the, we put in some social demographic variables because we consider these to be opportunity differences that can sometimes, sometimes impact grades. So we put those in on the first step. Um, and then we also put their science GPA in uh, as a way to kind of control for, I'm a student who's figured out how this system works to get grades. Um, so that's kind of the second step. And you can see when we control for those factors, we still get almost a nine point increase in their paper score that's based on if they did the ELI review or not. So the peer review activity, we just do a completion, which is kind of nice. Um, we're working on fancier ways to measure like something more interesting than just did you do it? But for a nice first pass to see if it worked, this, is, this, was, this was really fabulous. Um, I do have some data because I have a very um, strong passion for making sure my courses are equitable places for students. And so I did actually compare some of um, the groups that um, tend to have sometimes equity issues in STEM courses. So I had no significant differences for transfers or non-transfers, no significant differences for first gen versus continuing gen, and no significant differences for underrepresented minority or non. And so this is again on their paper score. So that, that was also very exciting. Um, oh, CJ, great question. This one was about 65. So that's the other thing. Like, it's, it's, it's nice that the regression came out with 65. Um, so yeah, we were, we were happy. <laughs> this one is a larger data set. The second graph is three classes combined. So it's about 150. So yeah. 
Um, the other thing I would say is an instructor note. So I teach at UCSB. We have very large classes here in, in most of our very popular majors and psychological brain sciences is I think our second most popular major. And so one of the things this really provides is a scalable way to, to help students um, in these courses because it's not something that is a lot of extra work for the instructor or my teaching assistants. Um, so this is something I can't like overestimate the importance of this because it's a very valuable tool. Um, but it's one of it's a tool that can get used in a large course, which is not something that you see very often in very valuable pedagogy pedagogical tools. Um, I would say students also really like Eli Review. They like the interface and they, they really enjoy, for the most part, giving each other a peer review. And then again, we tie this to uh, at UCSB to equity. I work with Linda and, and Maggie to tie this to equity and, and talk about it's also possibly a very powerful tool for mitigating some of the opportunity differences that students have. So that makes it um, kind of really exciting too. So I did want to say thank you. So again, acknowledge uh, Maggie, Linda, and I basically work on this um, all together all the time. And so I cannot take individual credit for anything here. Um, we also have some amazing people who work with us at Institutional Research to provide us with a lot of institutional data. So Laurel and Stephen. And then we have to thank Melissa because she is the reason my reviews are good. So just thank you to Melissa. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing so I can see everybody and check out the questions in the chat. Um, John had a question. Um, oh, Melissa, did you want to? No, go ahead. You can answer oh, okay. John's question. Yeah, so John, that's a great question. Yeah, I do not grade the papers. The TAs grade the papers and they run on a one to 20. So one TA for 20 students um, for the lab. And what I do is the, I make sure that, well, obviously I have a detailed grading rubric, but the other thing we do is the TAs and I meet and we have a grading meeting before they grade the papers so they can kind of normalize how much they're gonna take off for different parts of the rubric. And then what we do is um, I assign TAs, they don't grade the papers for their labs because they do give their students extensive feedback. So they do the Eli assignment. And then as you saw in that student comment, they do an intro draft after that, that the TA then gives them feedback on. Um, and so I, if I, what I used to have to do is actually standardize my paper scores by lab, obviously. Um, but for this data, because we've been doing Eli, which basically made everybody do better on the papers, um, and also because um, I think we got a little better of kind of norming the grades. Um, I haven't, I didn't standardize any of the paper data that you saw for this, the, the data that you saw there was, was um, not standardized paper grades because the TA is sort of, we, we, got, we got better at all of it. Um, but I think the students improved a lot, which was part of it too. There was not quite such a, such a thing, yeah. Um, so yeah, so you asked about scalability. So I am, I teach a lot of courses because I'm a teaching instructor. And so I don't use Eli as much as I should as far as um, what there, there are tools you can do in Eli where you can um, promote like student reviews, like you can say, oh, this is a great one. So and so did a great job. I don't, I'll just be honest with you. I don't do anything like that because I don't have time. Um, usually what we do at the beginning of the quarter is one of my TAs is in charge of the Eli logistics and they kind of handle all of it. So I promote it to the students as far as this is really important and making sure they understand the importance of doing it. Um, but I don't do any of the work. That's, this is what I do. This is what we do at UC. UC professors are really good at doing none of the work and having all the, getting all the credit. So I will say my TAs are, are fantastic and, and lots of support. So yeah, I, and I don't actually do a specific revision plan um, for these assignments, which Linda always wants to shoot me over. Um, because to me, when so the rationale assignment that they do in Eli, they get feedback, but then they turn an intro draft into their TA next. And so to me, the intro draft is kind of like the revision. Um, and then with the ANOVA, again, the final paper sort of ends up being the revision. But I do not use the lovely Eli revision plan that you could do. <laughs> And there's no shame. There's there's no guilt associated with that. I mean, I think you're what you're saying is in this compressed semester where Eli starts in week six, you need them to get through the process really quickly. Yeah. Um, so any other questions for either Aviva or Vanessa who shared really different approaches to using Eli Review?
Yeah, I will second John's comment that the the data is amazing. Um, and and it takes support to have that kind of amazing uh, data and we, we're all grateful to be able to work together on getting things done.